Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, to let everyone know, this is going to be a re recorded. My name is Maria Luisa Arroyo Cruzado. I'm an advisory board member, and we want to welcome you to New Poetry and Open Mic, hosted, of course, by the New England Poetry Club. I will warmly serve as your host for the three main features and the open mic. Please sign up for the open mic in the Zoom chat inbox at the beginning of the event. It'll be a limit of one po page per poem or one page or one poem. And I will have the joy of introducing our three main features. All right. The first one will be Kevin Gallagher. He is a poet, publisher, and political economist living in greater Boston. His new book of poems is The Wild Goose. Recent books are And Yet It Moves, Radio Plays, and Loom. Gallagher edits Spoke, a Boston era annual of poetry and poetics. He works as a professor at Boston University where he directs the Global Development Policy Center. I will put a link to the to Wild Goose in the chat. Please welcome Kevin Gallagher. Thanks so much, Maria Luisa. And great to see everyone. As I see the sun out here in Boston, it's uh, I can feel that we're, we're finally gonna be do doing these in person, but it's so great that for those of you who wouldn't have been able to come all the way out here, uh, that we can be here with you today. Uh, I am going to read from my new book, The, the Wild Goose, but uh, ever since I got this book about 10 years ago, I, uh, I've always opened up a New England Poetry Club reading uh, with this. Uh, Maria Lisa noted that I edited a literary magazine called Spoke here in Boston, and our third issue was dedicated to John Brooks Wheelwright and in, in a whole bunch of essays and some of his poems. <clears throat> and I hadn't uh, known until we did that, that uh, he wrote the, in 1931, he published the history of the New England Poetry Club from 1915 to 1931. So I'm just gonna read the first sentence. It is impossible to write poetry, which is merely poetry or American poetry that is merely American. Poetry must be poetic in a particular way Ours must be American in a New England way. So the Wild Goose was a little literary magazine that the poet or convict John Boyle O'Reilly created on a ship when he was being shipped in the middle of the 19th century from Great Britain for attempting mutiny to life imprisonment in Australia. These, these poems in this book are in some way a, a little magazine that I put together of poems that I wrote in Ockle Island, Ireland in 2018 and 2019, where I stayed uh, at the home of Kevin and Leslie Bowen and also as a poet in residence at the uh, Heinrich Boll Foundation. The first poem I'll read from the book uh, engages with uh, uh, the Irish mythological cycle. Uh, the, person who it was the first to free the Irish people in some way, at least in ancient times, was someone by the name of Lou. Uh, but Lou, uh, uh, Lou had to kill his grandfather, Baylor, who was an evil emperor that whenever he looked at anything, it would die. So when he walked among his own people, he kept his eyes closed, but would raid on the Irish people whenever they didn't, uh, didn't, uh, didn't comply. Um, so this is how Lou gets born uh, years before he frees the people. Birth of a nation. Ethelin smelled love in the sea, saw sex when she looked at the sun, and when she rested her eyes at night, she sensed love in her dreams. Her father, Baylor, made the Danannan pay up one third of all their grain, one third of all their milk and one child for every three to feed his greed and army. A druid told him that he would die by, by hand of his grandson, so he locked up his only child, Ethlin, in a lonely tower guarded by 12 warrior women, all sworn to never mention or ever let Ethlin see a man. She heard songs come from the sea that none of her guardians could make out. Whenever she heard them, she felt birds beating their wings in her chest. Too soon, Ethlin was fully grown, mature, and beautiful. She wanted her full breast to be kissed. She wanted to fill her empty womb. 
She was so alone in her tower. Baylor wanted to feed his power, so he turned Eflin into a boy and stole Keon's favorite cow. Keon went to Byrog, the she-druid, who disguised Keon as a woman and blew him high off to Baylor's island, where he landed safely at the foot of Eflin's lonely tower. Byrog spelled the guardians to sleep, and Keon was to look for his cow, but standing before him was the most stunning woman he had ever dreamed of. He turned right back into a man. As Keon stared at her, Ethlyn's whole body went warm. She now saw what she had only heard. She had now had what she'd only dreamed of. They each declared their love for each other in the same breath and gently threw off the other's clothes before they could breathe another breath. He buried his face in her breast as she put him between her thighs and sang a long soul psalm of love up into the skies. Chion wanted to live with her forever, but knew Baylor would kill him. Byrog blew him another wind. Keon left, but he left behind a son. The next poem takes place uh, uh, thousands of years later in the 19th century under British occupation out in Ackle Island when it would get really, really foggy. Uh, priests would sneak in through uh, small little boats and take the people up into the mountains and say mass. I dedicate this poem to Kevin and Leslie Bowen. <clears throat> we both worship the same God, but they don't like the way we do. Since they write the rules, we are forbidden to pray to you. A skiff slides in under the fog, and a beggar leaps out into a bulky sleeve. He roams the streets with an open hand, setting off a bush telegram for we who believe. So you roll fog down Crowen and give us all cover to set foot over the hills, then go down to Keem and step back up Crowen again. We Sweeney's, we O'Malley's, we Gallagher's, and our secret priest, priest rise to a hidden mass rock up Crowen Mountain. The candid sun shines over the fog below. The Atlantic wind behind us is your organ playing there. There is no way they will know we sing for Christ way out here. Sheep ba like chanting monks as the ocean claps on the shore. The priest unsleeves a secret crucifix, a cross, and our host. We kneel on heather and moss as the priest begs you to pray for us. The high cathedral cliffs of Minoan pipe out our voices high above the fog for a quiet song with you without them knowing. As we take this bread, your life, Shadows of slow rolling flog feel like flocks of angels sent from you to comfort us and cloak us from our troubles as we hike back to Dua and even Keel. About a quarter of the poems in this book are uh, is a series of monologues, which I call the Journal of John Boyle O'Reilly, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, Interestingly, Boston doesn't celebrate its poets and sculpture that well. From what I know, and I could be wrong, I, I count about five sculptures, Phyllis Wheatley, uh, Robert Burns, for some reason. Um, um, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting one others. And there, and there's two of, um, there's two of John Boyle O'Reilly, which is interesting. So John Boyle O'Reilly escapes from a uh, 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 escapes from captivity in Australia and swims out to a Bedford fishing boat. And he comes here and he becomes the editor, moves all the way up to become the editor of the pilot, which was one of the biggest dailies of the time. Uh, a poet, uh, John F. Kennedy supposedly uh, says that John Boyle O'Reilly was his favorite poet and a noted abolitionist. Uh, an earlier version of just these poems uh, was published in an artist book edition um, by Red Fox Press in, in Ireland. And it's great to have them all here in, in this book published by Loom Press. I wanna thank uh, Paul Marion for uh, the faith in, in this book. Um, it's great to have the O'Reilly Journal in this fuller context. I'll just read a couple of those. <clears throat> the Apprentice from Drogheda, 1865. The world is small when the enemy is loose. I'll rest when they have nooses on their necks. I know what I have been born here to do. 
I won't be a serf on our land they took. I won't just stand here as we starve to death. The world is small when the enemy is loose. We are losing our faith, our lives, our food. The ugly truth is they might hang me first. But now I know what I'm here to do, to fight for freedom and independence too. I'll kill undercover in a British vest. The world is shrinking and the enemy is loose. A silent voice won't do anyone good. Life is your chance to make your own events. I know what it is that I have to do, even if it means that I will meet my doom. At least I will die in the pursuit of truth. The world is shrinking and the enemy is loose. Now I know what I was born here to do. So O'Reilly infiltrates the British army and surprise gets caught and uh, escapes from, from some of the biggest British uh, uh, jails and gets sent off to Australia to be prisoner 9843. Riveted to 30 pounds of iron, separated from my compatriots, you gave me an ax and taught me how to swing. I looked at the army of mahogany lit up by thousands of white cockatees, motionless under a blue copper sky. My sweat would sting and my ax would ring as those giants of a lost age fell down. Black skinned bushmen moved all around us. Their chiefs wore hammered breastplates of pure gold. Not one single white man ever found an ounce, but these Australians, they never give up. As I said, uh, O'Reilly escapes, and uh, this is taken from uh, 1869, uh, page of the Times of London. Absconder, to the attention of all British colonies, 1869. John Boyle O'Reilly, registered number 9843, imperial convict, arrived in the colony per convict ship Hougamont in 1868, sentenced to life imprisonment 9th of July, 1866. Description, healthy appearance, present age 25 years, five feet and seven and a half inches, high black hair, brown eyes, dark complexion and convicted Irishman, dangerous, conniving, untrustworthy, revolutionary and against the crown, absconded from convict road party, Bunbury, 18th of February. Last poem I'll read from this section and the second to the last poem altogether. Um, as I said, he becomes a big editor and abolitionist here. And uh, this is uh, adapted from a, a, a speech he gave at Faneuil Hall in 1885. We don't have colored people's waiting rooms, but I know many hotels here in Boston where you would say all your rooms were filled if any one of them asked for a room. You can't legislate conceit out of white people. This outrage is higher than any law. The black man is the only American who has written new songs and new music. The black man is the most spiritual. He worships with his whole soul and not with his mind. The black man will bring great poets, painters, and great fashioners of God's beautiful shapes in clay, in marble, and in harmony. I shall be counted with them. The last part of the book is uh, an engagement with my father, which is where I get the last name Gallagher. I'm sort of global gar garbage. I'm a quarter English and half Italian. Um, and my father has passed away uh, a little while ago. And, and uh, all of this has been in some ways an engagement with all of that. Um, and <clears throat> uh, the last poem I'll read is called Those Summer Saturdays. Saturdays too, my dad woke up early, put on his grass stained Sperry topsiders, his green Bermudas with paint stains and whales, then took the entire day to mow the lawn. 
He'd snap open and fire up his Zippo, then mow two perfect rows with a Salem menthol 100 shrinking from his mouth. Time to take a break for a Miller Lite, to turn up Ken Coleman for the sock score, to shout it out for everyone to know. He'd save the empty cans to be redeemed, then light another butt for two more rows. One lawn, three packs, and a case in a day. But what did I know? What did I know? Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kevin Gallagher, for your reading. Please note that in the chat, I included uh, the link to Wild Goose. And before I continue, please note that we have nine poets signed up for the open mic. So that means that we have one more um, slot available if you should like to read. Now I have the joy of introducing Gail Mazur, and please correct me if I mispronounce her name. So Gail Mazur is author of eight collections of poems, including Land's End, Forbidden City, Figures in a Landscape, Zeppo's First Wife, and They Can't, can't Take That Away From Me. Founder and longtime director of the Blacksmith House Poetry Series in Cambridge, she taught for many years in Emerson's MFA program and has been a visiting professor in the graduate programs at the University of Houston, University of California, Irvine, and Boston University's graduate writing program. Please welcome Gail Mazur. And I'll invite you to unmute Gail. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Kevin, for that powerful reading. Um, I'm going to start with um, a poem called Mount Fuji, which is written to my late husband. And um, he, he was an artist. And we were kids, I have to say, we were kids when we were married, we were both still in college. Mount Fuji. Hokusai and Hiroshige, my first presents to you, two linen bound books that closed with loop ribbons and faux ivory clasps. Decades later, we gaped at Fuji from a window of Japan air and gasped together in Narita, a park so immaculate White rocks gleamed graphic in a river of gravel. Later still, you'd move between the floating worlds of Ukiye woodcuts and Chinese landscapes, whose surfaces entered you as if it had been faded. A draftsman's draftsman, Hokusai at 70, thought he'd begun to grasp the structures of birds and beasts, in insects and fish, of the way plants grow hope that by 90, he'd have penetrated to their essential nature and more by 100, I will have reached the stage where every dot, every mark I make will be alive. You always loved that resolve. You'd repeat joyfully, Hokusai's utterance of faith in works, possibilities, its reward that at 130, he'd perhaps have learned to draw. In Edo then, his beloved Fuji was seen as the true source of immortality, as for him it was to be. Will you always give me such spectacular gifts, you asked me that day, that day when we were 20. at 4 a.m. Some people have an appetite for grief, Emerson wrote. And years ago reading that, I thought, not me. Though I knew what he meant, I'd known people to default to it, people married to woe, dumbfounded by any sort of merriment. Still, I thought our venerable sage judged 
some people harshly from his conquered manse, where character meant transcending the insane fool he'd known. When widowed young, he nearly died of grief, of rending rage. Non-negotiable loss. We know some people seem to thrive on it. They can't be coaxed into the light. Lightheartedness won't touch them or delight. It's how negligible or an irritant, a cloud of gnats to brush away. Did Love D. Emerson disdain them for frailty of spirit? No, but he was done with it. That first loss tempering him oddly into calm for the losses that would come. The calm that said, grief can teach me nothing. Not me, not now. I know day when it wakes me can bring back endless night. Even here, long uncompanioned or companioned by grief and joy, the he in me. I hunger for laughter, for touch, for tears my hand can brush away. My work now, to continue learning to absorb the loss and live. Is that work enough? How can I know who or what can help me learn? I'm a peasant, humbled Mike Tyson said. At one point I thought life was about acquiring things. Life is totally about losing everything. For a fighter, a violent man, that's knowledge hard earned, whose things were bulwark against self-loathing and despair. It's clear he knows now things can't be enough. But I don't care what Tyson knows or don't know why I care. Does his abrasive cleansing knowledge touch me or is it its devastating articulation? Living on here, an excruciating replace of a life draining away. These visitations like falling trees unsummoned come my night a crushing yesterday, the lit bedlight won't erase or wish away. A uh, change of pace, I'm going to read a poem called The Flea. It's not actually about fleas. The Flea. The flea, that's what the year rounders call it, rummaging through tools or bric a brac, then gossiping all day at their tables in the blistering sun, their faded beach umbrellas barely shading the tarmac. This is what my mother did in New Hampshire, Sunday after widowed Sunday in her 80s, up at dawn, her wagon packed the night before, by noon, willing to mark down anything, not to have to rewrap and pack the whole kit and caboodle for the sticky hundred mile drive home. Today, I pick up a teapot, white with a smattering of pink and black and aqua stars, its flawed gaze a reject from the star. It's jaunty asterisks, its modern form, manufactured in Syracuse in the 50s pleases me seven starry cups and five chipped star-studded dinner plates, ordinary optimistic dishes, probably used by one Cape Cod family for decades, only dings and cracks now to tell their homely provenance, their good usage and keep the price down. Not starstruck, my mother would have felt the edges roughness with her thumb and found them wanting. It wouldn't have been the chips, she treasured her miniatures, her minis. They just weren't her thing. But like a ninny, I can make something of this, can't I? I buy the lot in her magpie memory, wrapped in old gloves for, for what a cappuccino would cost or a Parisian mystery. The next poem I'm going to read is called Forbidden City. 
and I have to find it because I didn't put my page numbers here. Forbidden City. Asleep until noon, I'm dreaming we've been granted another year. You're here with me, healthy, then half awake, the half truth. This is our last day. Life's leaking away again, and this time we know it. Dear body, I hold you pleading, don't leave. But I understand you can't say anything. Who are we? Are we fictional? We don't look like our pictures, don't look like anyone I know. Daylight flickers through a bamboo grove. We approach the forbidden city, looking together for the hall of fulfilling original wishes. Time is the treasure you tell me, and the past is its hiding place. I instruct our fictional children, the past is the treasure, time is its hiding place. If we told him how much we love him, how much we miss him, he would stay. But now you've taken me back to Loyang, to the garden of solitary joy, over a thousand years old. I wake, I hold your hand, you let me go. Auburndale, 1945. I had only one grandfather who was born in this country and my other grandparents were um, all immigrants fleeing Russia and Eastern Europe. So Auburndale, which was where I grew up, it's always seemed like the, uh, the name of a place that was a New England paradise, you know, just sort of the opposite of that, um, what, what all my non-American born parents called the old country, which I know um, a lot of Ukrainians who are here call the old country. This photo's matte surface feels more alive than any image a cell phone can provide. The way its shades of gray vary, the way sunlight suffuses the mother's pale hair, the straight dark hair of the boy and girl. Edenic scene, a backyard by a river, water lilies, mallards, a young mother and her children, the camera clicked and captured, gazing captivated at their litter of gray kittens. The war's just over. Schoolyard chants, jump roping taunts of distant enemies. I see London, I see France, I see a hole in Hitler's pants. Also almost over. Someday soon these three will learn what's happened to their family tree. But today the unimaginable erasures have yet to be discovered. Those distant branches with scratched X's marking their murdered ones now today about to be penciled in, oh, all dark and comfortless. Still here in the yard beyond the frame, a rowboat, a wooden dock, the one American grandparent sitting in an Adirondack chair, with his fishing pole, paradisial, pristine, all light yet no real shadows, only this dappling through the summer willow. How could there be no shadows visible yet? Only this lovely dappled light, like a blessing manifest. And the last poem I'll read is um, To the Makers, which is a variant on the Lament for the Makers, my variant. And, and I'm thinking, there's no particular specifics, but I'm thinking of the um, 
po the great old poets that came before all of us. To the makers, you were like famous cities with rivers and traffic, with architecture from ingenious eras, with protest marches and festivals, museums and pharmacies and criminal pleasures, all the essentials need to endure. Reading you, I revisit your structures of grids and avenues, your alleys. I follow overgrown paths. I revisit the terror and joy of being lost, the ways to court discomfort, to dare chaos, the knowledge of drowning in a pitch dark harbor. Tyranny and wars advanced in your histories, also infirmities of soul and body were your portion. Yet you were not yearning only, not heartbreak only. You were not the loneliest people alive. It was your work, and then you had one another. You spoke with gods and heroes. You cherished your conversations in many languages. It is true you were secretive observers, spies, but that was as it has to be. It was only your work you were given to serve. You weren't mere investigators of useless things, the pragmatic seemed no more or less suggestive to you than articles of turbulence or rapture, strands of hair in a basin, light in a dusty stairwell, a pitcher of sangria, woe and laughter, the feel in the hand of a broken thing. Day by day, your lives were a tumult of beginnings. When you began, you couldn't know. This you keep showing me, where your constructions would lead. What you made, you made from the inchoate, muscled and shaped not toward the monumental, but toward a form of truth that would matter, the inaccessible become necessary. Though I am speaking to you, I'm not alone nurtured by your art. Even today, you animate the minutiae of the vast unsigned cosmos. And though the 20th century ended without you, now, decades after your precipitate departures, your pages are still touched by many, still touch many. And the lit screens you never used sing your lines. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Gail. And for those of you who are participating in, or joining us for this reading today, after we have Lynn Schmidt reading their poetry, we'll definitely un unmute ourselves to give everyone a resounding applause before our open mic. So thank you so much. I have the joy of introducing now Lynn Schmidt. Lynn Schmidt is a grandchild of a Holocaust survivor and a mental health professional with a focus in trauma and healing. She is the winner of the 2021 the Poetry Question Chapbook Award for their collection, Sexy Time, and 2020 New Women's Voices Contest for their chapbook, Dead Dog Poems by Finishing Line Press. Other chapbooks include Gravity, which is listed as one of the best breakup books by Book Authority, and I'm Becoming a Role Model. In 2012, they started the project Abortion Chat, which aims to lessen the stigma around abortion. When given the choice, Lynn prefers the company of her dogs and one cat to humans. <laughs> Please welcome Lynn Schmidt. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so as mentioned, my collection Sexy Time came out in February, um, but today I'm going to be reading to you from my collection Dead Dogs Poems. Um, I'm pretty emotional following Gail's reading. That was some incredible poetry. Um, Gail, if you read in the chat, you'll see that I like noted which lines just like hit super hard for me. That was, that was incredible. Um, so I'm gonna try to get through my own poetry without crying now. <laughs> Here we go. On how dogs choose their people. The day he proclaims, I want a dog too. I shrug and say, okay. When he brings her to meet me, I stop mid-step, taken by the soft chocolate of her fur. She's beautiful, I whisper, and she licks me. In the days that follow, she finds herself on my bed, follows my dog and me to the bathroom, lays outside the door, and waits. 
he sees she is supposed to be my dog. And yet she has picked me because trauma recognizes trauma and seeks it out. When he takes my money, my prescribed painkillers and his stuff, I tell him to leave the dog. When the vet consoles me saying, she was sick before she was yours. All I hear is she was yours. <clears throat> the next poem I have for you is nap time, which is quite fitting because my co-host is taking a nap. Uh, so that is Enyo. Uh, there are poems about all of my dogs uh, in this collection. I'm not going to read uh, Ky Kyla's and Enyo specifically, but they're all kind of mentioned in this. So the next poem I have for you is nap time. I listen to their breath as they sleep curled against me. I crack apart my sternum so they can crawl inside the safety of my chest. Here, they rest soundly, bodies limp, trusting that there is no evil, no harm will come. I am a statue standing still, a guard armed with bow and arrow to ensure safe passage. And when the time comes, I too fall asleep beside them. <clears throat> so in 2017, uh, my dog Baxter, who was on the cover of this, was diagnosed with a really aggressive cancer. And last week was actually the anniversary of that. So just before he was diagnosed, my girl Kyla was also diagnosed with a cancer. Um, and so it was just a really devastating time for me. And that's what this collection explores in general is just knowing your dog is dying and bracing for that. And so the next poem I have for you is Roadmap. There is no roadmap that suggests turn left at cancer and right on chemotherapy street. It doesn't remind you to wear gloves or hold off until that beverage until after 10 o'clock because that marks the 12 hour interval and you can't be too drunk when handling medication that can absorb through your skin but is somehow safe enough to give him. There is no roadmap to canceling plans, forgetting plans or coming home early because there was a bad day. There is no roadmap to trying to foster new relationships because those feelings you felt were just under fingertips. And now they're somewhere under a needle while you wait for hope, for treatment, for anything other than what's happening here. <clears throat> when you try and pray this away, we pray in the space between breaths, the space between the snowflakes as they blanket the ground that this thing, this ham-like cancer will not return. We offer sacrifices, broken dates and canceled plans, three hour drives after midnight for money to afford this treatment. We scrape by on handmade foods because we can't afford luxury anymore. They caution me, hope is beneath the sea. The iceberg has struck and we are sinking. We are so far gone, even Pandora's box has given up. This thing will take you from me. They tell me to be careful with my prayers because there is no hope here. And when we get the test results back, they give the cancer a new name, terminal. And they're right. Like the exhale of a held breath, all of the hope is gone. <clears throat> the reoccurring nightmare where you won't be able to save them. I want to tell you that when the flood waters sweep the car away, my surgically repaired shoulder will become bionic, smash through the window and pull her to safety. I have had the nightmare water in my mouth as I scream her name and I don't get to her in time. <laughs> I have had the nightmare where I save one and not the other. And I have had the nightmare the one I imagine is closer to reality, where we all submerge. Whew. This has like been the hardest book promotion for me because like these are my poems. These are about my fur babies and they hit very, very close to home. Um, but I appreciate doing these readings too because a lot of people don't talk about the grief surrounding their pets and how hard it is. Um, so 2017 was now five years ago. Um, and obviously this is still very fresh for me. And so if any of you are grieving for your fur kids, um, these poems are for you. So the next poem I have is Blood Please and Library Books. 
After 14 minutes, they come back to me crumpled on the floor and say I need to look at an aspiration, at an x-ray, to look eye to eye at the thing will take, that will take you from me. They give me a deadline, four to eight weeks, and I offer every sacrifice the Bible warned me against for anything longer, and my blood plea is answered. For the next six months, we live at this impasse of living and dead simultaneously. Like tomorrow doesn't matter because it's already here. We've had our return date stamped at the end of our novel, and now it's just a matter of returning you to the library. We eat meals in silence. I cook more than I used to. I wear gloves and wash my hands after your meals, after you puke the medication up and I shove it back down your throat because I don't know how to get through tomorrow without you. And then tomorrow is today. You can't get out of bed. You collapse getting into the car and I plead with my bone marrow with every skin fiber of my being that today is not today, but it is. So I play God and force you to wait. I force you to stay with me one more weekend where we can't make it up and down the stairs anymore, where you refuse to eat and get out of bed. And then Monday comes. Whew. <laughs> um, the next poem I have for you is In the Morning. In the morning, I don't wanna get out of bed, don't wanna shower, don't wanna stop for breakfast, coffee, and order two breakfast sandwiches, don't wanna drive to work, don't wanna sit at my desk, don't wanna watch the knife of time gut the next eight hours, don't wanna help you into the car, don't wanna go where we go next, don't wanna turn right at the stop sign, don't wanna hear our song on the radio, don't wanna park the car, crawl into the back seat holding you, liquid just pouring down my face. Don't wanna open the door. Don't wanna walk in. Don't wanna hear them tell me I'm making the right choice. Don't wanna feed you treats out of my hand. Don't wanna watch the needle slide in. Don't wanna hear you yelp the second time they missed the vein. Don't wanna feel your body go slack and then stiff. Don't wanna rub your ears until all of the warmth has drained from them. Don't wanna walk out holding an empty leash, empty harness. I don't, I don't, I don't. <clears throat> the next poem I have for you is called The Next Appointment. In the morning, I should wake up early enough to complain. I should mix the greens in with the canned food because I read somewhere that greens help fight cancer. I should run them both out before we leave. I should get in the car, still wiping the sleep from my eyes, complaining about tired, looking forward to an iced peppermint latte. We should drive an hour, meet with the oncologist, and they should do the ultrasound we pushed off last appointment. They should tell me with soft voices that I'm still losing the battle. I'm still only buying time, but he looks so good. I should breathe a little. I should be late to work today, should have to use PTO. Instead, I twist the key to my P.O. box and so many cards read, I am so sorry for your loss. Um, and as I said, uh, for those of us who are either facing losing our fur babies or who have, um, this poem especially is dedicated to, to you and to us. And it's called To You Before Your Loss. I do not envy what you'll go through the stages of grief that come before the actual loss, the diagnosis, and if not that, the understanding that life is no longer permanent nor promised. But along this journey, I wish you this, cloudy eyes from mountaintops where the sky touches the sea, blankets of ocean, ocean tackled by sand and everything in between. I wish you slower walks that remind you to catch your breath, days that lead to longer naps by your side, Above all of these things, I wish you old age, a gray face and arthritic bones, and the grace to brace for the inevitable, no matter how this moment comes to you. And at the end, peace. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, before we continue, there are two things. Number one, let, let's please um, unmute our mics so that everyone 
you know, the, the, our main features, Kevin Gallagher, Gail Mazur, Lynn Schmidt, can really um, hear our appreciation on this marvelously weird Sunday <laughs> weather. <laughs> so thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. You know, and, and, I, and I'm, before I put the names of the nine poets for the open mic, I did want to share just brief on uh, my brief responses to the three poets today. Thank you so much, each and every one of you for the gift of your time. You know, as I listened actively to your poetry, I felt that there were three distinct lightning rods to specifically ground all of us on this Sunday afternoon. For Gallagher, John Boyle O'Reilly's persona becomes incarnate in poems that intersect Irish history, culture, myth, politics, imprisonment, and exile. For Mazur, grief is intimate in far places like China and as close as New Hampshire. Here, the simultaneities of love and grief, loss and longing, childhood family rituals are relived again in black and white photos. There were so many coded languages of all types of love, romantic, familial, cultural, and place love. And for Schmidt, I must admit, I am a poet and mother of a human child now grown. Your poems, however, evoke for me unconditional love and it's a two-way unconditional love. I've, I've often had the, the, the mindset that, the, that fur babies or pets offer us unconditional love. In your poems, you remind us that unconditional love goes both ways. You know, in terms of being present to those who Who's, who, who give us our, their loyalty and their company and their love. So thank you all. I shall now put um, the names of the open mic readers and I will uh, joyfully introduce you all. And with that stated, please do correct me if I mispronounce your names. So first on the mic, we have Jeffrey Brommer. Could you please unmute? Thank you. I've never done this before, so here Welcome. goes. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's from a walk in Maine, which actually occurred on November 1st, 2021. The title of the poem is called Coming Home. I walked among some trees. They welcomed me for who I am. They gently asked, what took you so long, Jeff? Embarrassed, a bit ashamed, I whispered. I feared my own nakedness and didn't know who I was. The trees reflected for a moment, quietly conversing among themselves. Then in total love and acceptance, opening themselves fully to the heavens they bowed together as one, covering me tenderly, their leaves and branches, with their leaves and branches, we hugged. That's it. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to invite John Holgerson, please, to unmute your mic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the poem I'm going to read is called The Fence. It's from my third book of poetry that was published last year called Convictions of the Heart. Maria came to a small hill at sunset. She crawled to the top on her stomach, her elbows digging in the dirt like pistons. She carried her father's small strapless black binoculars in her right hand, making sure the waning sun was at her back so there would be no gleam off the lenses. She raised them to her eyes and saw the fence. It was a soccer field away. Scanning it slowly, she found the board with the Z-like split in it. Knight, her accomplice, joined her on the hill. Maria descended in a crouch to the big river. The half moon glint guided her to its bank. The big river, now parched and shallow from the long, hot drought, invited her. 
The warm brown water climbed skinny legs to narrow hips, then receded resentfully. Maria slithered along the marshy ground at the fence she yanked down on the Z board. It cracked open, a yawning hole appeared. She could smell the fertility and richness of the soil. It hung like dry laundry in the night air. American freedom, she thought. She scurried through the hole, snapped the broken board into place, stood and stretched. The welcome cheer of cicadas was deafening. Looking up, she watched swift storm clouds eat the last remnants of the handicapped moon. Full dark enveloped her. Warm raindrops kissed her face and cruised the wide contour of her smile. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next, we have Sally Cragen. Please unmute your mic. Oh, um, please unmute. Hi, Sally, we still cannot hear you. All right, how's that? All right, uh, this is called Stadium Shows. It's from a collection called Louder, A Thousand and One Nights Out. Stadium Shows. It feels like the blink of an eye, the way we close the lid of the phonograph and then turned on the radio. The 70s were a fine era for bass heavy hit songs by supergroups that amazingly came to New England. There would be a photo of Ian Anderson, deranged pixie with his flute and my brother Hal's hit parader and a tour list for Jethro Tull on the back page with the Boston Garden circled. Tickets were reasonable, more reasonable than pot, which then went for $40 an ounce. Parentheses, lids had vanished somewhere between Poco and Led Zeppelin too. The circle on the tour list turned into an offer to buy a ticket plus the bus fare. A kid at the high school arranged for a greyhound to come to the school parking lot to drive all the kids, mostly heads, some jocks, and some like hockey player Doug Barney with long hair, all the way to Boston. The party bus was immediately blue with swirls of smoke and deafening sound system, and pretty much the entire back row had bongs in the inner pockets of their down jackets. And of course, most of us smoked cigarettes anyway. Some, like my friend Cheryl, had learned the small bottles behind the counter at Doc's Packy were more effective and fast acting than ordinary six packs. My brother Hal in the back and I midway down by a window thinking someday, somehow, a bus would take me to Boston and then return without me, which was a frightening thought. But in the meantime, with a screech of brakes and a blast of diesel smoke, we pulled up in the loading zone and dispersed, each with our concert tickets we checked a thousand times, except for Cheryl, who'd finished her flask of four roses. While most of the kids swarmed into the garden, she was stretchered out of the bus. I asked Cheryl if she was all right, and she shook her head and raised her fist and whispered roughly, rock and roll, rock and roll. Cheryl sobered up enough to join our row. Her sister and her best friend brought her in, and though some of her time was in the gang bathroom having a puke, her spirit shone brighter than all but Ian Anderson and his merry flute. Thank you. Thank you. And please may invite Tom to unmute his mic. Thanks, Maria Luisa. Um, Tom Laughlin here. Um, when I taught in uh, the prisons in the 1990s, Thomas Kuntz was a student of mine at MCI Norfolk. He's been in the news again uh, over the last couple of years. You may have seen last month uh, on February 16th, the governor's council voted finally to approve uh, the commutation long overdue, 30 years of his unjust sentence of natural life, which is life in prison without parole. Um, he's now waiting uh, for the parole board to meet and finally grant his parole. I have been called back 
to my memories uh, of him and experiences of the last couple of years teaching in prisons um, many years ago. Um, I was struggling and trying to say so much uh, about Thomas that my drafts were getting longer and longer. Uh, and so I forced myself into a villanelle. Prison class. In any other culture, he'd be a prince, whispered the guest writer I'd brought into prison that night, knowing of his poor court appointed defense. A bright high school athlete with a mother from Port-au-Prince, he became a Marine to keep college in his sights, though in any other culture, he'd be a prince. On leave, his warning shot above the bat-waving mob was self-defense, fleeing a party detonated by a racial fight, but his was a poor court-appointed defense. Inside gray walls, the young man spoke with quiet confidence of wealthy Faulkner, Baldwin, and Updike. I felt in any other culture, he'd be a prince. At trial, no ballistics that might have proved his innocence, but a white man was killed that night. A shame about the poor court-appointed defense. Decades he's been behind walls ever since the judge gave him natural life. In another culture, he might have been a prince, but instead he got a poor court-appointed defense. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, Kent Wittenberg, I'd like to invite you to unmute your mic. Thank you, Maria Luisa. Um, I'm gonna read a poem called Wind. Your true self, colorless, odorless, invisible, we know you only secondhand, rumored, a prisoner of gravity thrown off a spinning top. A vortex of vortices, often restless, angry, your true weight known only in horizontal space. You fall sideways, pulled by some absence of your presence. You sink to the center, only to be spun back out again, erratic in your vectors, ever changing. You who rock us gently whisper like a lover in a lover's ear, sometimes so softly we forget you are here at all. You who we cherish when our curved sails create a little absence that misses a presence, our boat is only too happy to fill thanks to you, little brother. You capricious one, our almighty father who may flick a finger and flatten our poor sky and gentle, persistent breeze. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Elizabeth Sylvia, could you please unmute? Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm not a very experienced reader, so um, my poem was just published in Salamander, and it's part of a, my very first collection, which is coming out in the fall, called None But Witches, which is all poems um, that were written when I started reading through the entire catalog of Shakespeare's plays, um, and they're mostly about women. And this one's uh, inspired by Henry VI, and in that play, the queen's lover is beheaded and then she carries his head around with her and that's what this poem is about. Words from a head. How long did I lie in the pool of my life before you brought me to your lips? <laughs> there was a moment I rolled away from you and the breathing. The dark eye of my neck burst suddenly open on the block, turned upward. You couldn't have held me then, hot and slick as I was in my own blood. Let another have washed me and brought me to you. Now I am dead. No one can whisper anymore about how I loved you, for you take me everywhere, and I am your witness made memory. I teem with your ecstasy and rage. 
Your love rattles the chewed rubber of my brain. And wherever I, you go, I feel you holding me like the muscle that wraps each bone to its sacred position in the body, so beautiful and close and only in this world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I apologize for the misspelling of the next reader's last name. And please forgive me if, um, and do correct me if I mispronounce it. May I please have Mr. Tetsotso Mok um, unmute your mic, please. Thank you. Uh, it's Tesso Somok. Thank you. Tesso right. Somok. Uh -huh. Thank you. This piece is titled uh, Buford Benali. At 82419 on March 3rd, 2021, the code was called Buford and Benali, Dene man, husband, father, and grandfather, started his journey to the Milky Way, no longer the Trail of Tears, but the Trail of Stars. Why no longer the practice of more mounting the ash body on a horse and heading as far north as possible, where the horse was slaughtered and both buried in a fellowship towards the light in the night sky. Desiba Vanali, his wife of 22 years, sat in disbelief looking at the white eraser board with the crash cart timeline at the Presbyterian Rust Medical Center in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. At 806, it read, start, patient unresponsive, CPR initiated. But before that, he was the loving father of three girls. Something Desba had always wanted for him was a grandson. At 808, he was given a pulse check. Cupid, his grandson, would not be born till close to a year past Buford's passing, but he would not but he would have to wait till the age of four, past the four years, the nay tradition of not naming the dead. At 809, he was given his first one milligram of epinephrine. At 810 and 811, he was given one amp of bicarb each time. Something Desla was not totally in line since she was originally Chebok, from Chebok, Alaska, a federally recognized Yupik village with a population of 951 in 2020. At 8, 8, 12, 49, he was given a second one milligram of epinephrine. They had been married for 22 years. After spending a week working with Desla in close quarters, he asked her to be his girlfriend. Six months later, he asked her to marry him. At 8, 15, with a failure to show a repeatable pulse, a central line was placed to the right femoral with one amp of dextrose and a third one milligram of epinephrine. Desba was very angry that she couldn't mourn Buford openly. The Dene saw death as a natural part of life. Grief or mourning was akin to blasphemy. The grandmother suggested that the creator had made a mistake when deciding it was the time for someone's life to end. And on that point, Despa was in agreement. At 8.16, no pulse. At 8.18.49, Fourth, one milligram epidemic given, 819, and your own antirhythmic given. She had chosen to marry him in the traditional way in Navajo land on her grandmother's hogan by a Diné medicine man into a culture with a good deal of respect for the power of spoken language. Speaking about Buford's death and other negative su subjects was taboo and might attract death. At 820, normal saline was started, 821. His CO2 was 11, where it should have been 90. Desba could not bring herself to the act of, not, of choosing not to speak about Buford, even if it, it was a form of veneration or respect to a degree that the net tradition thought is that it was more disrespectful to speak of the dead because doing so would interfere with their journey to the afterlife. At 821, he was given last one milligram of epinephrine. At 822, no pulse detected. She did not want her daughters or granddaughters and Cupic to be shadowed by Buford's Shindi, a Shindi, a spirit that remains after a person has died. For Desva, it was all of a sudden, even though his test for COVID-19 came back negative, she had to accept that if Buford had become sick, the creator had made a mistake. A24, no pulse. A24, 19, code was called. Thank you.
Thank you. May I invite Maureen Medina to please unmute your mic? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, this poem is called Happy Ending, and it'll be in my first book called My Fears Out Loud, which will be published in July. So, <clears throat> happy ending. Is that what you came for when you sought my people out because you had a bad day? Fetishizing my existence and eliminating me simply because you couldn't control yourself? Your white supremacy could not be contained. Shots fired, hatred in every bullet, and yet we've died many times before. When you came to our countries uninvited, our beds unsolicited, our cultures that you appropriated and then sold to us as a sign that you were here. Children born from a lack of protection, colonization, is that a justification or an ultimatum? You forced us into your melting pot, watching all the colors become one, dividing us with a gradient. White is right, but yellow is the next best thing. Stand back, tiger mom. She vilifies blackness as though it's dirty, ugly, but black lives matter and they are beautiful. We are beautiful. And no, brown is not lesser than, brown is not illegal, brown is not lazy. We are brown too, and we work hard. We provide for our own, and we stop. Tiger mom won't have any of it. We are not them, she says. We earned our way. Good at math, straight A's, straight hair, typecast, Though we are black and we are brown and we are indigenous and we are every single color, texture and blessing. We are not a monolith and we are storytellers if we believe the myth of the model minority. Hey, how do Asians name their kids? Just drop a bunch of silverware down the stairs and listen to the sounds they make. Ching, chong, chink, gook. We are the punchline, but we respond with obedience. Loyal to the monster that mocks chinky eyes and seeks the crease in our eyelids without ever questioning how a colorful society can brim with oppression and individual suppression, or how a colorblind society overlooks what it won't put a name to. Racism. Xenophobia. How can we call them strangers when we have all met before? Hate crimes all different iterations of the same sentiment that we are other. We are less than, and we are stained by color. Distorted by your concentration camps, cheap labor and conditioning, you pit us against each other and run away without incident. You loathe all things foreign and call us essential while you try to erase us. We adjust and adjust our assimilation irrelevant to your contempt for all things made in China. Well, the whole world is watching and they know what you have done. They see who you are. They know that you, you have thrived from our stolen freedom and you are not a disease. You are not the exception. You are not a mental health issue. You are not a disability. You are not a broken childhood and you are not a bad day. You are our friend, lover, spouse, neighbor, sister, brother, nurse, doctor, lawyer, judge, and jury, and you are the problem. You are violence perpetuated. You are the stigma, and you, you misogynist, white supremacist, colonizer, oppressor, racist, terrorist, you, <clears throat> you were made in America. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Stephen Honig, may I please have you unmute your mic? Well, a little bit hard to read after the last two poems, but I'm gonna give it a try. Um, this poem is called Memory of Objects. Never clean your storage unless you are prepared to engage the memory of objects. You will tell me that things have no memory. 
and that the memory is in the eye of the holder, a trigger of recognition, emotion, melancholy, of a person, moment, epiphany, death, such as the insistence of logic imposing will on wonder. <clears throat> Here is a toy my son played with in his bathtub, splashing and swooping this small yellow duck, and warm water and bubbles are described to, to me. Here is a sweater I wore when I was newly married, telling me with a smile I cannot get into it now. Here is a comb, amber plastic with long fingers that entwined my first wife's red hair before it grayed and fell to earth at the hands of medicine, reminding me of fine strands of soft whimsy. Here is a baseball glove, recounting that grab of a line drive, July 4, picnic 1957, and is that leather mitt still proud? Be fearful though of the date of things. Dates are without their own memory, but jolts of age slapping you. Could it have been 60 years ago? How old was I then? How old now? How long to remember? I will need the objects to tell me who I was before I am myself. There is a brass matchbox in the shape of a shoe, small and with a hinged lid where the tiny foot would go. It traveled in my mother's mother's sack from Russia when one of those presidents you never know anything about who was after Grant? Was it Hayes? Who can recall? And it reminds me that it was not seasick and lit many a wood stove fire on the farm before the Great Depression and sat on a tenement windowsill when my mother took it with her running to the city, a young girl in search of her tomorrow, carrying her yesterday with her as an ornament. Sitting now on a shelf in a corner bookcase stuck in a back room, anxious to stir itself and tell me its journey. Some things are so old that they are tired of telling their stories, but they are compelled. No one ever believes me when I tell them <clears throat> that my objects have memories within their brittle atoms, suspended droplets of minutes and soul, coming out to frolic or complain when someone holds them. They laugh these objects at the conceit that it is the holder with the thoughts. They know better and more than you know, so. Be careful when you choose to clean your closets, basements, attics, back rooms. You may be silent, but you are asking for a dialogue with time. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And please may I have Michael Ball, um, unmute your mic, please. Okay. Uh, as a vignette of my, one of my grandmothers and her older best friend, Swan Sisterhood, a sorority by choice of only two. They were whisper and cackle buddies, robustly rocking on the porch, looking up at Jersey mountain orchards, riding matching swan arm rockers. Those crinkled dames were bounded on three sides by petunia planters. Pastel abundance softened nothing. Two yentas, do not call them harpies. They were not ugly nor vicious, rather urgent. They walked the long block to the great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. Wednesdays too, they reconnoitered at the beauty shop, exchanging on the reportage by spooks of Marsham Street, demanded accuracy, breezes carried their truth. They noted follies, loves, and shames of passers-by, teens to ancients. They looked and listened and learned. The true avocation of homebodies was field sport without burrs, mud, or sweat. Were they doomed by God for gossiping to rock their chairs forever? At some time in that West Virginia someplace, the pair yet rides their swans. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That brings us to the end of our open mic. So what I would love to do is to ensure to oh, give yes. everyone a round of applause. <laughs> Please unmute. And again, thank you so much for the main features. Right. And thank you I all for the, the open mic, would, uh, the courage and um, vulnerability. I would ask you maybe 20%.